You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Hey, everybody. I'm Dr. Michael Bruce, the sleep doctor, and this is Win the Day with my buddy, James Whitaker. Hey, winners, we have got a super special episode of the Win the Day podcast today because we have our first ever repeat guest, Dr. Michael Bruce, Woo-hoo! known around the world as the Sleep Doctor. We had so much positive feedback from the first episode, as well as many unanswered questions, so we're going to leave no stone unturned today in helping you sleep better. If this is your first time joining us on the Win the Day podcast, hit the follow or subscribe button so you can get access to episodes like this one as soon as they are released. And while you're hitting subscribe, we'd really appreciate it if you could give the episode a like or a five-star rating so we can help get the word out there and inspire more people to win the day. The quote for this episode comes from inventor Thomas Edison and says, never go to sleep without a request to your subconscious. Never go to sleep without a request to your subconscious. Powerful quote, that one. I won't give too long, of, too long of an intro for Dr. Bruce today because you can check out episode 44 of the show where we spoke about his incredible list of achievements in depth. That episode was called Sleep Your Way to the Top with Dr. Michael Bruce. It's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and wherever you listen to or watch podcasts. So check out that episode. It's got a ton of tips, hacks, and secrets to help you sleep better. For a brief overview, Dr. Michael Bruce is a four-time best-selling author, clinical psychologist, and sleep expert. He has appeared all over television, including Oprah, The Today Show, and on The Dr. Oz Show more than 40 times. The man is everywhere, and when he's not doing media appearances, Dr. Bruce works for some of the most successful individuals on the planet who want to perform at their peak with as little sleep as possible. So if you want to perform at your peak with as little sleep as possible, which I know you do, this is the episode for you. We've had people all over the world submitting questions, so we're going to make sure Mm -hmm. the sleep doctor gives you the help you need. If you'd like to submit a question to me for the solo episodes or for any guests who come on the show, join the Win the Day group on Facebook. We'll include a link to that in the show notes. We're also going to talk about his new book, Energize, Go From Dragging Ass to Kicking It in 30 Days, available worldwide right now. Before we begin, remember that the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with my good friend, Dr. Michael Bruce. Michael, great to see you. I mean, your list of accomplishments, now you are the first ever repeat guest. Does this go straight to the top of the list of your accomplishments? Without question, <laughs> this is at the top of the of the list for sure. And it was great. I love that quote. So a quote was from Thomas Edison. Is yep. that right? So he, if you had to pick one individual, is the one person who has messed up sleep for more people <laughs> than any other person. Because as the inventor of the light bulb, uh, it became possible to be able to be able to work at night. Oh, of course. Right. And so then all of a sudden people sleep shifted. So we used to, at one point in time, we were what's called an agrarian society, right? So mm-hmm. when the sun went down, you went to sleep. You would wake up actually in the middle of the night. You might have a meal, be intimate because, you know, everybody's living in the same house, maybe meet with some relatives, then go back to sleep for the second sleep and then wake up when the sun came up and start with the farm once again. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's actually been a popular news story out fairly recently. And so people are always, you know, worrying about that. But when, as soon as the light bulb came around, Gone. Damn Thomas Edison. <laughs> I know. He has really messed it up for all of us. <laughs> Provide some context. How bad are sleep problems at the moment? You've been working in this field for yeah. so long, but where are we at with, with sleep? So to be very fair, it's pretty terrible out mm. there. Um, to give you the, the easiest statistic that I can give you right off the top of my head is during COVID, we have seen a 23% increase in sleeping pill prescriptions written. 23% increase. You don't see things happen like that. Like that is crazy numbers, right? And so, and that's just people with prescription sleeping pill increase. The CDC just released a report literally this week saying that um, triple the number of people are now taking melatonin than were before COVID, which by the way, may or may not be a good idea. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, people are out there, they're searching for solutions. Uh, Cannabis sales in the sleep marketplace have skyrocketed. So- To be fair, I think people are looking for solutions. Mm, Yeah. In the last episode, you mentioned a lot of people out there are medicating with things like alcohol as well. Yep. 
Is there anything out there in terms of a supplement or a prescription that you recommend for people that would rival close to a deep sleep that you could get naturally? Or is that almost impossible to do through some type of, uh, you know, separate substance? Well, so it's an interesting question. I'm going to answer it in kind of a unique way. So yes and no. So there are substances out there that you can take that will give you a natural sleep, but their natural substances. So if people are deficient in magnesium, we know that magnesium has a proficient effect on sleep and you supplement with magnesium, you're getting as natural sleep as you would get, right? So that might make some intuitive sense. Vitamin D is another one, iron is another one, and melatonin is the final one. So when I'm assessing somebody and they'd come to me and they say, Dr. Bruce, you know, we, I wanna get on something for sleep. I'm like, hold on a second. Like, let's make sure that your body isn't deficient in something that we know affects sleep. If it is, let's fix that deficiency first and see how your body <laughs> reacts. Like, why add something else when it doesn't need to be added? Mm -hmm. And in many cases, we can just get people to change their diet to include these vitamins and minerals that are essential for sleep, and it's all the better. Talk to us about chronotypes. Just for people mm -hmm. who haven't heard the first episode that we did together, just provide a little bit of an, uh, a context for some of the terms they might not be familiar with that could come up today. Absolutely. So chronotypes, for folks out there who never heard of the term chronotype, you've actually heard of some of the vernacular. So if you've ever been called an early bird or a night owl, those are chronotypes. So what I did in my third book, which was called The Power of When, I my contribution to the literature is we used to only think that there were three chronotypes. So there were early birds, there were night owls, and then people in the middle, we called them hummingbirds. I don't honestly know why we <laughs> called them hummingbirds. It seems like such a <laughs> stupid thing to, to call them, but they were called hummingbirds. Um, and so uh, what ended up happening was, is I contributed a fourth chronotype. This was a, and by the way, these are genetic. So you don't get to choose, right? So people are always like, oh, I want to choose to be an early bird. It's like, <laughs> dude, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you know, it's Wouldn't like, we all? Yeah. right. You're like, I mean, I could literally look on your ancestry.com or you're like uh, 23 and me. Uh, I can tell you exactly what you are because it's literally sitting there on your genome. So, so once we, we did that, I found one for insomnia that was very similar to the other ones. And so I decided to group them all together. And that's when I came up with the power of when. So I renamed them because I'm not a bird, I'm a mammal, right? And I wanted to choose animals that actually held the same circadian rhythm that we were talking about. So early birds become lions, okay? And so if you're a lion, you're one of these people that gets up at like 4.45 in the morning. Like, to be clear, I don't like morning, I don't like morning people, I don't like mornings, like you guys are too chipper for me, right? But these are people that wake up hyper early. Um, they're usually the COO of a company. They kind of, you know, they make a list every day and go from step one to step two to step three kind of thing. In the middle, instead of hummingbirds, we call them bears. Oh, by the way, lions are about 15% of the population. Bears make up a lot, like 55%. So like one in two people is a bear. Um, but to be honest, it's the best to be a bear. I kind of wish I was a bear um, <laughs> because nine to five is a bear schedule. Yeah. Right? So everything on society schedule works for a bear. Um, night owls become wolves, right? And so wolves, we know they're creatures that hunt at night. I'm a wolf, I'm a late night person. I never go to bed before midnight. Mm -hmm. I just don't do it. It just isn't in my blood to do. <laughs> um, we're a little bit more out of the box thinkers, kind of the creative types of people, my artists, my actors, uh, scientists, people like that are kind of in that category. Um, uh, but we can't get up in the mornings. Like we really do hate mornings. The fourth category, which was my my category that I added, we call them dolphins. So people might be like, okay, we get the other three, Michael, but why <laughs> dolphins? So people don't know this, but dolphins sleep unihemispherically. So half of their brain is asleep while the other half is awake and looking for predators. And I felt like, you know, my insomnia clients, that's kind of how they're, they're never quite asleep. So I felt, and it's kind of cool. Dolphins are like the coolest mammals in the water anyway, right? Like who wouldn't want to be a dolphin? <laughs> so um, so once you take my chrono quiz, you go to chronoquiz.com and you take it. Um, what you learn is that you're one of these four categories. Then it gets really interesting. So you might be thinking, well, what do I do with this? Well, this actually tells us your the timing of your hormone schedules. So what's fascinating about that is, let's say you're a lion, an early person, you wake up at, let's say, 4.30 in the morning. That means your melatonin turns off, your cortisol turns on, adrenaline pops, and everything starts for the day. That's a very predictable schedule, right? Almost every single lion does it the same way, as does every single bear and every single wolf. So if I'm a wolf and you're a lion, your melatonin turns off at 4.30 in the morning, mine might, mine might not turn off until eight. Mm -hmm. If I try to get up at 6 a.m., my melatonin's still going. Right, So it doesn't make any sense for my body to be getting up that early. So now all of a sudden there's the right timing 
for doing certain things. Since interviewing you the first time and knowing you as a friend and reading all of your books, it seems interesting to me out there that there are so many of these really aggressive, these like lifestyle entrepreneurs who are trying to pump <laughs> people up at 3 a.m. You've got to wake oh, up. You've got to do two hours no. of meditation. Do they just have no context of the research behind sleep? Correct. So it's very interesting when I when I come across these people because I try to educate them, right? And so I say, look, I'm, I'll make this super simple for you. Take my Take my quiz. <laughs> And you're going to learn why you're having a failure rate of your clientele, mm -hmm. right, um, at probably 15 to 25 percent because you're telling them to do something that they physiologically cannot do, mm -hmm. right? They're going to fail at this and they're not going to continue with your program. And so here's the problem, dude. You've got a great message and you're telling it at the wrong time, <laughs> right? And so if you could just tell it at a different time, you'd be able to get it further across. Another case uh, study has been in business. So we have entire businesses that are chronotyping their entire business, right? So when it first came out, Dave Asprey over at Bulletproof is a dear friend. He's always supported all my, my research and work. He was like, this is awesome. It, number one, power of one is required reading for all Bulletproof coaches. But number two, he chronotyped the company and then he would have creative meetings with the creative people when they were alert and focused, <laughs> right? As opposed to times when they weren't because they're mostly night owls. So having an 8 a.m. creative meeting didn't work too well, right? So things like that are where you can actually, you know, utilize the science in a very unique way just for yourself. Yeah, it seems like an absolute no-brainer, doesn't it? <laughs> things like that. Your new book, Energize, who did you write it for and what problem did you want to solve? So I actually wrote it with Stacey Griffith. Uh, she's my uh, co-author and she's one of the founding trainers of this company called Soul Cycle. They do the indoor bicycle things. So, um, so the book was uh, an emergence of our friendship in certain ways. So she was training me uh, on, on physicality and I was helping her with her sleep. And, you know, when you're working with somebody, you start talking about, you know, what's going on in your business? What's going on in your business? And so I, she was like, you know, a lot of my clients tell me that they're tired. And I said, well, you know, are you asking them about how much sleep they're getting? She's like, no, nah, I'm, I'm doing the more physical things. Then, of course, mine said, you know, I'm feeling really fatigued, which is very different than tired. And she was like, well, are they moving? And I was like, I don't know. I'm a sleep doctor. I don't ask those kind of questions. And so we started asking each other. We started asking the questions that each other normally would ask their clients to the others. And we started to discover there's a relationship between movement and sleep, right? So when you're moving a lot, you don't find yourself sleepy during the day and you sleep better at night. So that was beginning to be this interesting hidden code. So then I said, well, Stacy, help me understand. Like, how do you determine what kind of exercise do you put somebody on? And she said, well, I look at their body and I say, okay, this is the type of exercise you should do. And I'm like, okay, explain, <laughs> right? Like, how do you do that? Um, and she's like, well, if somebody has got a little bit more weight on them, I, I don't tell them to go run three miles because they're going to fail and they're not going to be motivated and they're not going to come back. I might tell them to do more like resistance exercise because they, they're they stronger because they've got more weight behind them to be able to push weight around and get them to succeed there and slowly bring them into the other. Whereas if I've got a long and lean person, I'm not telling them to lift weights. I'm telling them to go for a run for three miles because that's what they like to do. And I said, oh, so you're looking at people's body types. And she said, yeah, I guess I am. I said, remember back in high school when we learned these things called endomorph, mesomorph, ectomorph? And she was like, oh, yeah. So when you look at chronotypes, they're genetic. When you look at body types, they're genetic. So, you know, it doesn't take too long for the two of us to start thinking about it and say, I wonder what would happen if we started to look at the data of getting these types of pieces of information together. So I've been very fortunate. We've had over 1.5 million people take the Chrono Quiz. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of people out there who've got data on. And so we contacted a group of 5,000 people and said, hey, would you be willing to take the body type quiz? And we started to learn some things which were really interesting. So it turns out that if you're an ectomorph, kind of a long and lean person, you're almost never a wolf. <laughs> Interesting. You're almost always a lion, right? So people who are long and lean are also people who are waking up at 4.30 in the morning, right? People who are uh, a little bit on the bigger side, like endomorphs, they have a tendency to be more night owls. We know night owls take riskier decisions, eat un more unhealthy food and have more medical significant issues. So it's now it's starting to make sense. Then we figured out body type has to do with your metabolism. So now we start to understand more like, oh, these people have metabolic differences. So then we started looking at intermittent fasting. So that was the third component that we added here. So Stacy was like, we need to get these people to move. I know I want them to sleep. We've got to figure out also fuel. 
right? Because what are you going to eat? Now, I got to be honest with you, bro. It's a big topic, right? <laughs> like I don't have the qualifications to do that. We weren't bringing in a third author. So we said, if we're going to stick to- The book's to, getting bigger than Ben Hamm. Right, exactly. <laughs> we're like, well, I think what we're going to do here is we're going to look at intermittent fasting, right? Because also there's so many cultural differences in food choices and vegan and paleo and keto or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we said, all right, let's do intermittent fasting, which number one, we know gives you a lot of energy. So there's a lot of significant data around intermittent fasted or time-restricted eating um, or even fasting mimicking that shows mm -hmm. that people have a lot more energy to them, uh, reported energy, and then they actually do more stuff when they have a limited amount of time where they feed versus a, a larger amount of time when they fast. Mm -hmm. So we started looking into that and then we be figured out that you have these interesting markers. So when I've been an intermittent faster for about seven years and it works great, works even better when I do it based on my chronotype. Mm. So I'm, an eight, I'm a late night person and I can't eat breakfast. I'm not a big, like I like breakfast food, like I like eggs and bacon and all that kind of stuff, but I can't eat it in the morning. Like I will get sick, sick, sick. So I, I can start eating around 11 o'clock. So I was naturally already almost intermittent fasting, but I just pushed everything a little bit later uh, and it worked even better for me. So what we show you in the book is you do the when of your fasting based on your chronotype, but then people always were wondering like, well, how long do I fast? Like, where do I start? So it turns out you can do it based on your body type. So your ectomorph, long and lean, they really don't want to lose a lot of weight. Mm. So they'll fast for 12 and feed for 12. The, if you're a mesomorph, kind of more of a V-shaped sort of body type, so your shoulders are bigger than your waist, those people are going to have a 14-hour fast and a 10-hour feed. Whereas the people who are endomorphs have a little bit more weight on them, looking to lose some weight, mm. they're going to have an 8-hour feed and a 16-hour fast. So you see what I did there? Mm. You move it along the way based on how fast their metabolism is. So now we've got the when to do the intermittent fasting and how long to do the intermittent fasting, that is giving them cre credible energy. If you wake up and go to bed based on your chronotype, which we talk about again in the book, gives you a lot of understanding there. And then the final component was movement. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of the work that you've been doing is leaning into people with who they inherently are rather than trying to be someone you're not. Sounds like an absolute <laughs> no-brainer, doesn't it? And one of the things I love most about Energize is how tactical it is. It's it's really good. And mm, 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 mm. every morning I think about you, I wake up and awesome. I'm like, gee, I can't wait to have my morning coffee, but I'm going to wait 90 minutes. I love it. What do you suggest for people in that time of waiting the 90 minutes? Is there something in particular mm. they should be doing to mentally get ready for the day or, or physically to get prepared? 100%. For the day? So- I'm going to warn you, I am militant with my morning routine. <laughs> so, and to be clear for all the viewers and listeners out there, I didn't start like this. Like I started slowly adding different components to my morning routine, but I like to have a cup of coffee uh, in some mornings and I've got 90 minutes to kill, right? Before I'm going to do that. So kind of what do you do and how do you do it? So for me, what I found is I've got the house to myself. Mm -hmm. It's quiet. I can do whatever I really kind of want to do. And a lot of self-reflection, things of that nature are kind of born from that environment. So I start out with my meditation. So I actually use a headband. I'm not a great meditator, mm -hmm. but I found this piece of hardware that gives me instant biofeedback. Um, so it, it, it's an app that you use on your phone and it re relays to you. So as your brain is getting into different waveforms, so it's actually actively measuring EEG. Um, it's really cool. It's commercially available. Um, it's called Muse for folks who are interested. And then I go into this deeper state. I do four different meditations for 10 minutes a piece. Um, and then I feed my dogs and then I take my dogs outside for a walk. Um, and so I'm getting immediate sunshine that way, um, because that's important at that time, uh, cause I'm getting up at six 15. So I'm ending my meditations by seven. Then I've got the dogs fed by seven Oh five. Then we're outside by seven ten. And we do a loop around the neighborhood. So I get my fresh air, my sunlight, and my exercise. And it's time to be exactly 15 minutes mm -hmm. of walking time. Then I come back into my office. I take their harnesses and leashes off and I sit on the ground and I spend five minutes just petting with my dogs and appreciating them and being grateful for having them in my life. Um, there's nothing wrong with unconditional love every single morning to start your day. Um, and then it's 735 and I meet a group of men every morning on Zoom and we do breath work together. So I'm a member of a men's group called Metal, um, which I know you know about. And um, we have a group where every morning, anywhere from five to 40 guys are on there and we do Wim Hof breathing. So I do that from 735 to eight o'clock. 
Um, and then at that point in time, if I want, I can have my cup of coffee because I've been up since 6.15 and <laughs> there you go. Um, sometimes I choose to do that or sometimes I don't have it then and I'll do my exercise then um, for 30 to 45 minutes and then I'll have my cup of coffee. We'll be back with the show shortly. If you're a business owner and have a podcast of your own, we've got a free gift just for you. It's called the Recurring Results Roadmap, and we've created it to give you a detailed blueprint to scaling your business using your podcast. So if you're overwhelmed with a never-ending to-do list, struggling to work on the business instead of in it, or simply want the formula to massive business growth, this is for you. Click the link in the show notes and download a free copy of the Recurring Results Roadmap. It will show you exactly how you can use a podcast to maximize your business revenue. All right, let's get back into the fun. What about someone, you and I both do a lot of speaking engagements. What about oh, yeah. someone, if you, you're flying to a new city and right. you've got this speech at sort of six in the morning and you want to get yeah. your ass into gear <laughs> to make sure you, you know, you're sleeping in a hotel room, which can be right. be really uncomfortable for a whole variety of different scenarios. Is there anything that you switch up in terms of the routine to make sure you deliver your best without requiring all of those different elements? Absolutely. So then there's the short version, <laughs> right? And so it, depending upon how I'm feeling, number one, what's my fuel the night before, right? So did I eat well or was I out with the clients? Did I have alcohol? You know, like what happened there? Because that's going to determine what my fuel needs to be in the morning, um, number one, and how my sleep was <laughs> the night before. A salad versus a heavy pasta. Right, exactly. So <laughs> what I really try to do is kind of start planning for it the night before. So what I, I usually do is I have a salad with some form of protein on it. Um, I try to stay away from sugar. Um, if I have alcohol, it's one glass and that's it. Um, I know that's not very fun, but it really promotes me to be able to have a better night's rest. So if I have to get up early for a presentation, I can be Johnny on the spot. Then in the morning, I cut my meditations from 40 minutes to 10. Um, and I cut my breath work to instead of four rounds to two. And um, I do a small self meditation to put myself into my spot. Um, and what I basically do, my best man at my wedding, um, he gave me this advice uh, right before I was about to get married. He turned to me and he said, put your game face on and let's go. <laughs> and I hear him say that to me every single time before I go on stage. Nice. That's great. <laughs> I, I love that it's, you're not adopting an entirely new ro routine. You're doing a modified version of what you know works very effective for you. Uh, that's really good. You, you talk so much about consistency. And in fact, on that consistency, yeah. it can actually reduce the amount of sleep that you need. Yeah. What is the balance between using something like an alarm clock mm -hmm. that can wake you up at the time you need to maintain that consistency versus the disruption it might bring to your natural um, body clock? Yep. So great question, by the way. And so depending upon what your sleep goal is, we'll have, we have alarm clocks for some people and for some we don't. Mm -hmm. So it really just sort of depends upon what we're trying to accomplish. For a lot of people who are wanting to shrink that sleep schedule, we actually try to eliminate the alarm so that, because what, so let me back up and explain what I mean by shrink that sleep schedule. So you, in the opening, you talked about how some people might want to, you know, be able to have a high quality sleep in a short amount of time. So how does somebody do something like that? So I did that to myself and it's been quite an interesting journey. So as a night owl, I go to bed at midnight every single night. I'm very consistent about that. And then I don't use an alarm in the morning time and I was just gonna allow my body to sleep until it woke up. So when I started doing that, and this is going on probably six, seven years ago now, um, within the first three weeks, I was waking up at 7.30, it jumped back to 7.15 just kind of naturally started to wake up earlier. Really didn't notice much about it. And 15 minutes here or there doesn't really mean that much. Within a month, I was waking up seven o'clock. I'm not a morning person. Like, I don't like, I'm very serious. Like, I don't like mornings, right? It, it kept winding its way back. Within six months, I was waking up at 6.15 every single day. I wake up at 6.13 now every day. It's ridiculous, <laughs> right? And I go to bed around midnight, right? And so what's happened is, is because I sleep within my chronotypical swim lane, if you will, right? My sleep consolidates. So my theory is, as many people out there are sleeping out of sync mm. with their chronotype, which is requiring them to have extended amounts of sleep to get the sleep that they need. Mm. Whereas if they just slept within their chronotypical swim lane, it, it will naturally self-reduce and, and allow you to have more time in your day. Dude, I have 90 more minutes in my day, mm. every single day. 
Incredible. Think, what would you do with that? You know, like if For you're an sure. entrepreneur, what would you do with that? Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. But you have to really honor your body. Like, like you have to know and understand what your body is looking for and give it to it. As you said, and it's so funny because so many people are now starting to say like, yeah, you're just telling people to like look inward and do that, <laughs> right? You know, like, and it makes so much sense because I think so many times we think about how can we outwardly distort or change things. And so I like to try to stay, you know, mother nature was smart. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Rather than trying to resist every, everything as well. It can, yeah, yeah it's interesting. Well, you know, what I loved, uh, the inclusion I loved in Energize, cold showers. I yeah, was oh, like, yeah. yes, Absolutely. I thought that was a really good one uh, to include that. Now that's a good way to wake yourself up in the morning too. Yeah. Like if you want to give yourself a, a cold burst. And one of the things we talk about in the book, I'm going to double, double back on that second question was um, how to energize yourself when you're not in an energetic space. Mm. And that sometimes that can happen before a lecture or presentation or things like that. Right. And so um, for me, it's music. Right. And so, you know, what music, jo you know, makes you go bonkers, right? If you're driving down the street and your favorite song comes on the radio, what do you do? You start bopping around, That's you know? It. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You know, you just kind of all of a sudden, but it changes your energetic profile almost instantly. So keep a playlist in your back pocket, you know, on your phone. So when you are feeling energetically down, stick in your headphones, walk into a safe space, turn on a song or two, and guess what? I can assure you it will change where you're at. Yeah, rather than resisting what you hate, lean into what you know works. Exactly. Yeah, you know, with cold showers, I have never noticed something that provides sustained energy levels throughout the entire day. I used to have a massive slump after lunch, no matter mm -hmm. what happened. I can tell you Co why. Yeah, cold showers in the morning, and then that seemed to alleviate it completely. Yeah. So what's interesting is is there's a so sleep follows a core body temperature your core body temperature cycle, and so as you uh, get later and later at night, it goes higher and higher and higher. Around 10, 10 30 at night, it hits a peak, and then it begins to drop. That per drop is a signal to your pineal gland to re release melatonin, which is that key that starts the engine for sleep, right? So it drops, 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 drops. Somewhere between one and three in the afternoon, there's a slight increase and then another drop, okay? So melatonin gets produced again, just like it does in the middle of the night, but for a very small period of time. And so the reason why so many people have a problem between one and three in the afternoon has to do with this secondary melatonin spike. Mm -hmm. If I had to guess, you're cold showering it away. Mm. right yeah. you you know you beat, beat your body up with a good cold shower you <laughs> drop that temperature you know and then your body doesn't have that hiccup again for sure and you know the mental stimulation that you get of knowing that i was able to overcome like it's only a little bit of adversity in the whole scheme of yeah. things but having something that you're faced with like that to kick off the day gee it just sets the tone for things i love getting having way. cold showers but i can't do them in the winter yeah it's hard for it's, me to do in the winter. When it's cold outside, I don't want to take a cold shower. About a year ago, we went to Big Bear. We spent a few days up there. I had a cold shower there. It was like liquid snow coming right. through the shower. I was like, whoa. So are people in the very cold climates, maybe don't, you know, maybe yeah. put a little bit of hot in there as well. Exactly. <laughs> Are afternoon naps a good idea for most people? Because I found that with me, I, I'm like, cool, if I'm going to get a power nap for 20 minutes, but then I, I just find myself instinctively just hitting snooze, snooze, before mm. you know it, two hours have passed, and then you can't <laughs> sleep at night, and you've ruined your whole sleep cycle. So are okay. afternoon naps a good idea for most people? Okay, so what you described was not what I would consider to be an afternoon nap. <laughs> <laughs> what you described is what I consider to be a disaster. Okay, so let, let's break it down for just a second. So there are two types of naps in terms of length, mm -hmm. right? So there's 25 minutes or less. Less, there's 90 minutes or more. You never really want to go in between those two. So you ever take a nap and feel worse, not better? Mm, yeah. That's because you left longer than 25 minutes and your body got into deep sleep. It's hard to get your body out of deep sleep, especially if you're sleep deprived. Yeah. Um, so for folks out there who aren't getting enough sleep, it's very easy to take those longer naps. 90 minute naps or longer are good because it's a full sleep cycle. So if you're going to sleep, you might as well get a full sleep cycle in. Word of caution about napping. If you're an insomniac, napping is a terrible idea because all you're doing is you're lowering your amount of sleep drive that you're building up in your brain that you're going to need that night. I don't care how exhausted you are. You're better off going outside, walking around, getting some sunshine, uh, not necessarily drinking caffeine, but just being up and out and awake than you are taking a nap more times than not if you are an insomniac. Um, is napping a useful tool? You bet. Um, I use it with my CEOs, my athletes, my um, artists all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, as an example, um, you know, I work with uh, Steve Aoki, the electronic dance music uh, DJ. And by the way, he allows me to talk about how we work together. <laughs> and um, he's napping 
eight, 10 minutes before he goes on stage at one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So he is instantly energized. The second he comes out of that nap, he's on stage. And I mean, he's blowing it up for three hours. I mean, the guy throws these huge sheet cakes all over the place. I mean, it's nuts. But I mean, he's having a blast and he's got tons of energy because he's kind of using a nap to do it. Now, I will tell you that um, there's something new in the napping universe uh, these days, new nap technology, believe it or not. Um, and so uh, I started working with this company. I brought you a sample of it. It's called Nap Jitsu. Great uh, name. <laughs> nap Jitsu. Right? I mean, it doesn't get any better than a name like Nap Jitsu. The marketing team would be like, bravo. Once they came up with that, they're like, yes, we're on to a winner. <laughs> we're in. Um, and so what these guys have done, which is really interesting. So. I used to talk about the idea of what I called a Napa latte, which was where you took a cup of drip black coffee, you cooled it down and you drank it, then uh, took a 25 minute nap. And when you'd wake up, you would have burned through the sleep that you needed. The caffeine is kind of waiting in the wings and you'd be good for about four hours. Great technique. I've used it for many, many years. These guys have kind of, if that was like version 2.0, these guys are like version 3.0. So what they've done is they've taken sustained release caffeine in a pill form, but also nootropics. Mm. So smart herbs, right? So ashwagandha and ginkgo biloba and some things like that. So what's really fun about this product, and I've been playing with it for a while and like my friends and family love it, is you lie down, take your 25 minute nap. And by the way, there are a lot of people out there who can't nap, mm. right? So they're like, oh, I can't fall asleep during the middle of the day. We've now learned that there's this thing called non-sleep deep rest. So lying in a quiescent state, so lying in a dark room, uh, you know, quiet, uh, comfortable um, is very beneficial. Uh, it's not like sleep, but doing that for an hour is worth about 20 minutes of sleep. So mm. like taking it just a time out for a nap can be OK. Um, but they also provide a small amount of uh, herb that can actually help you, valerian, that can actually help you fall asleep for a few minutes. Then when you wake up, you're rocking and rolling. Valerian, I have that in my sleep tea. I have every night. Exactly. Oh, interesting. Uh, in episode 44, when you first came on the show, you spoke about if you haven't got anything to recover from, you said sleep is a recovery process. Mm -hmm. If you don't have anything to recover from, then of course, you're not going to sleep at your best. Right. There are things that I do, and I'm sure a bunch of other people in the win the day community as well, that require a lot of brain power during the day, even though it's not physical expenditure, right. I am just wiped, you know, sometimes if, you know, whether it's like multiple podcast appearances or speaking mm -hmm. on stage where yep. it's a really important thing. Is that what you mean also in terms of something to recover from, or is it purely a physical pursuit to help you sleep? No, out? it is a bimodal pursuit. So we're talking physical, um, emotional, uh, for some people, spiritual, mm. like it's like whatever you, you just need to be active. Right. Um, so sleep is recovery. And if you don't do anything <laughs> right to recover from, you're not going to sleep particularly well. So, but I, to be fair, I like it to be a balance. Mm. Like you don't want it to be all physical, mm. Right. Because then what ends up happening is you go to bed too early. Right. So when you've been out in the garden or playing softball all day or whatever, what do you do? Oh, my God, I'm so exhausted. I'm just going to go to bed at eight o'clock. Right. It's a really stupid idea when you normally go to bed at 11 because all you do is lie there exhausted, staring at the ceiling. Right. So but if you halfway do your exhaustion physical and halfway is more mental, emotional, you know, what have you, you're going to feel a lot more balanced in your day. Your energy is going to be more balanced and your sleep is going to be more balanced. That quote that we mentioned at the start of this episode, never go to bed without a request to your subconscious. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? And for people who are serious about a high performance life, yep. improving their abilities while they're sleeping, is that uh -huh. something possible? 100%. So we know that during REM sleep, you move information from your short-term memory to your long-term memory. Um, also during uh, stage three, four sleep, it, there's something called the glymphatic system, which pulls all the waste out of your brain. So uh, things like uh, beta amyloid and tau. So uh, what it does is it cleans the whole system out. And so your brain actually probably thinks a little better while you're sleeping. Um, and also there's not as much input. Right. So you don't have visual input because your eyes are closed. You don't have hearing input because it's quiet, hopefully that kind of thing. And so what we know is the old saying of sleep on it. It's actually a really good idea. <laughs> um, so what I oftentimes tell uh, my CEOs, my entrepreneur people is I say, look, you don't want to be perseverating on your business problems before bed. OK, you don't be thinking like, oh, shit, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? But if you are if you are if you have a problem. Right. And you want to try to solve it then instead of thinking about all the aspects of the problem, just say to yourself, I'd like a solution. Mm -hmm. And just allow the data to go to the places it needs to go to in your head. You will be pleasantly surprised when you wake up 
Um, in many cases, if you journal when you wake up in the morning, a lot of my clients like to journal in the morning time to just kind of get stuff out of their head. The solutions will start to come. It, it's not gonna happen immediately. Mm -hmm. um, usually for a lot of my clients, it's five to seven days, but um, it's it works. It's a great tool to just say, I'd like a solution to the problem. And that's it. And then I actually have people then do a gratitude list, Yeah. right? So take my mind off of the problem. I really want to think through the idea of gratitude. And I'm going to be very straight with you. This isn't a woo woo. Mm -hmm. Oh, hey, let's all be grateful <laughs> type of thing. There's real data here. So there's data to suggest that if you're optimistic before bed, you fall asleep more quickly and you have more positive dreams. Yeah. Like, Real data. <laughs> this might be one of the most powerful things ever said on this show. It is really, really important. Every day I wake up, I do a journal as well because, mm -hmm. and I also, as part of that, it's gratitude. It's what's unique about the last 24 hours. And it's what three things am I going to do that would make today a win? And if you're going to bed solution focused, right. and over time that manifests in getting those solutions, and you're going to start to have faith, which would reduce your stress. Yeah. So when you go to sleep, at nighttime when you go to bed, you're going to be far more likely to go to sleep because you have faith that the problem will alleviate yeah. based on how your neurons are firing while you're asleep. Absolutely. Yeah. It's incredible. Just let it flow. Yeah. It'll happen for <laughs> you, bro. Sleep on it. I love it. Uh, there are things like air quality and allergies and all of these different mm -hmm. things affecting yeah. respiratory systems. Are any of the things that people put in the home around that, like air purifiers, are these things worthwhile or are they a bit of a gimmick? What's the science say? So the science says they're worthwhile, um, So especially if you've got asthma, right? So you want to get as many particulates out of the air as you possibly can. Um, and we are right in the middle of allergy season, mm -hmm. right? So there's going to be more stuff that's happening. So number one, should people have an air purifier? I like an air purifier in the bedroom um, specifically. So something that can run for a few hours um, to really get that air very, very clean. Also remember if there's particulates in the air and they get up into your nasal passages, it'll cause congestion, which will lead to snoring. Mm -hmm. So that can be disruptive to you, can be disruptive to your bed partner. Also, if you have sleep apnea, it can make your sleep apnea worse if you have more congestion. So it's a good idea to have an air purifier. Um, other things that I tell people um, is uh, keep your windows closed, mm -hmm. um, specifically in the bedroom. Like I get it, spring is here, it's awesome. But if you live in an area where there's pollen, it's all gonna come wandering in and now you're gonna have particulates floating around. again congestion. You got to decongest for better rest is how I kind of phrase it to for people. Um, other things is um, take a shower at night, right? So you're walking around enjoying the day, but you don't realize, but you've got all kinds of stuff all over you. Like take a nice warm bath at night. Um, there's data to show warm baths at night can help with insomnia, but you can get all that pollen off of you. And then uh, only other things I would say is do your laundry pretty regularly. So don't like if you've got outside clothes, like throw them in the laundry room as soon as you take them off. Like don't leave them in your closet because then again, all these particulates and allergens are going to get all over your closet, going to get all over your clothes. It's going to be hard to get rid of them. You and I talk, you and I are both parents, we talk about our kids all the time. Yep. Uh, we had a newborn who joined us on the 5th of January, which it's just, you know, it can be disruptive, especially with you have other, other kids and different things like oh, that. Yeah. Consistency is such a big piece <laughs> of the work that you do. When consistency is not possible, what advice do you have for, for parents? Is there anything they can do in that situation? run for the hills, <laughs> take an Ambien and hope for the best. Um, it's hard, you know, um, to prepare for, so to be honest with you, when you have inconsistency in the schedule for especially small children, you really just need to prepare for the worst, mm. right? Because the kids are going to melt down within that next 24 hour cycle. It's just going to happen. So it's lowering not their your fault. expectations is one of the best things. You Absolutely. Can, like, yeah. don't blame the kid. Like if the kid melts down the next day at grandma's house because you had them on an airplane two hours past their <laughs> bedtime, it's not the kid's fault, <laughs> right? It's your fault for keeping them on a freaking airplane when they should be in a quiet environment in bed. So like, I mean, those are the types of things I think people need to really kind of think through is, especially with young children, sleep times are a priority. Now, I get it. There's going to be some instances where it's not going to happen. Okay, well, number one, prepare for cranky kid. Uh, but number two, um, see about napping, right? It, you can have a, you can, uh, you know, make your napping schedule a little bit different that next day, depending upon the age of the child. And if you've got teenagers, it's not too hard to tell a teenager to nap. Um, they'll they'll do it almost on, on command. So that shouldn't be a problem from in most cases. So- I think you can kind of, uh, you know, look at it sort of that way. What about, uh, do you any work with like toddlers and, and kids specifically sure. on the, on their sleep? Is there anything for people who uh, perhaps have got some trouble with toddlers or young <laughs> kids sleeping that uh, any tips you'd suggest for the parents? to? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so there's lots of different, 
problems that come up based on the age of the child. So some general guidelines, and I am not a pediatric sleep specialist, but I do have two kids um, that we went through. My wife did all of the kid sleep stuff. I want to be clear. I was the wimp when it came to it all, <laughs> especially with my daughter. If my daughter even whimpered, I was flying across the house. Like, Carson, are you okay? Yeah. And Lauren's like, stop, don't go in. Daddy's coming. Right, exactly, exactly. So a couple of general guidelines. Number one, don't put your child in the crib asleep. Put them in the bed awake. Interesting. So what ha So there's this thing called object permanence. So especially when you've got itty bitty kids, what happens is, is that if they don't see you, they think you're gone forever, okay? And so the problem is, is that they're asleep, they're snuggled in on your chest, it's warm, it's cuddly, it smells good. All of a sudden, they're supposed to wake up multiple times throughout the night, they wake up, it's cold, um, it's dark, it's quiet, I can't hear a heartbeat, they're gonna freak out. But if you put them in the environment ahead of time, sit across from them, they can visually see you, but you don't wanna be touching them. And then you're singing to them, you're talking to them, whatever you're doing to them, but you're letting them self-soothe. That seems to be the key characteristic of children being able to get themselves to sleep. Then as their eyes gently close, you can you know leave the room if you wanna have a monitor, which you nine times out of 10 don't need. But if you want one, then you turn the monitor type of thing on and then you're probably good to go. The other big issue is kids who won't stay in the bed, right? And so as you get into toddler age range, it's like, I want a glass of water, I want this, I want that. And it's, you know, it's crap. All they want is attention <laughs> and they wanna, you know, be out and about because something else is fun and going on. So I had this problem with both of my children. <laughs> so here's what we did. My they get son, massive FOMO, don't they? The kids. It's unbelievable, right? <laughs> so so here's what I did with them is uh, my son Cooper loves Hot Wheels. So as you know, Cooper and I go to Hot Wheels conventions <laughs> to this day and we collect vintage Hot Wheels. But when he was very, very young, um, we used them as bribes. So to be clear, I'm bribing my child to stay in the bed and it works. So we go to the, we go to the toy store and I say, Cooper, get 12 of your favorite Hot Wheels. And oh my gosh. And he's, and he puts them all in the bag. We run home and he, he gets them out and he's about ready to rip them all open. I'm like, oh no, you can't do that. And I'm like, and we put a digital clock in his room and we say, when this clock, and he knew his numbers, when this clock reads 730, you can come out and there's a basket right by my side of the bed and you can have one Hot Wheels, all right? And if it's a, and if it's a minute before, uh-uh, has to be those three numbers in that order. And he was like, okay. And so he did it for three days. He showed up at 7.30 for three days. And then on the next night I said, okay, now you have to do two days. And it was all positive reinforcement until we ran out of Hot Wheels, which was fine. And he figured out that he needed to stay in his room. Yeah, and the so it is formed at that point. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, there are a lot of ways to do it. I will say one thing that a lot of parents don't know, but probably need to, and maybe they know it in the back of their head. I am not a fan of the cry it out method, okay? Like I, I've seen too many children really go escalate high and get to the point of vomiting or their face is red. It's just not necessary. If your child is freaking out that much that they need you, don't lock them in their bedroom or lock them in their crib or whatever it is that you're doing. Attend to them. There's a reason that this is going on and you need to get them, again, comfortable with self-soothing and things of that nature. Uh, you know, way back in the day um, when I was a kid, I'm 54, you know, ferberization as, as it was called was based on the methodology of Dr. Richard Ferber from Harvard. He wrote a book called Solve Your Child's Sleep Problems. Very popular book, by the way. It's got some great information into it, but he was a, he was big on crying it out. Well, he recanted that. I think it was like three years later, but people still do it. So at the end of the day, I think there's an easier, softer way, but at also you need to have some structure, okay? Like 90% of children's sleep problems is parents not following directions. Like I have to reach through the child to strangle the parents half the time because they just won't follow the rules. Like rules are simple and kids love structure. So if you can just give them the structure surrounding sleep and if they're old enough, educate them. Hey, you wanna know, you wanna be able to play and, and go on the bouncy house and not be so tired? 
if you sleep at night, you're going to even have more fun playing there. And you just get them involved and get them interested and get them educated. And then they like to sleep. Yeah, the other day I spoke to Chris Voss, author of Never Split the Difference, yeah. and I asked him, like, I know Chris. talk to me about hostage negotiation with toddlers, oh. and he said their behavior, if it's bad, is a sign that your approach needs uh, needs work. And I was like, oh, that's so good. <laughs> you don't have a bad kid, you've got a bad approach, you know, a bad style of, of yeah. parenting. So that's great. Normally we do the Win the Day Rocket Round. We're not doing that today because we've got a bunch of questions from the Win the Day community. If you'd like to ask some questions on our guests in the future, join the Win the Day group on Facebook. Very first question comes from three people. We got Debbie, Adrian, and Glenda. Any tips for someone who wakes up in the middle of the night? 3 a.m. seems to be the time when, when all yep, these people are waking up. I can explain up why. And has trouble getting back to sleep. Any tips for those people? This is the number two question that I get. The number one, no, well, number two or number three. The number one question is what bed should I buy? Mm. The number uh, two question is... What is it? I think this one is the number two. Like, what happens if I wake up in the middle of the night? Yeah. And then the number three question is, what is the other one? What bed do I buy? Um, oh, it's usually about cannabis. Mm. So this is a very popular question for a couple of different reasons. So one, biologically speaking. So you, you noticed 3 a.m. seems to be a popular time. It actually is biologically speaking. So remember how we were talking about that core body temperature curve a little while ago? So remember, it's dropping, it's dropping, it's dropping. So at about 1030 at night, hits the peak. When it cr crests that peak, um, brain releases melatonin, down, 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 down. Guess what? Somewhere between one and three, three o'clock in the morning, it starts to curve up and your body starts to get warmer, which means you're in an easier arousable state. Mm -hmm. Not intimacy arousal, but arousal to be awakened arousal. So it's much easier to wake up at that period of time. That's number one. Number two, everybody wakes up four to five times a night. Mm -hmm. You just don't remember it because you roll over and go back to sleep. But because you're at this time zone where it's easier to arouse, you're in a lighter stage of sleep. So when you wake up from a lighter stage of sleep, it's harder for you to get back. When you when you wake up from a deep stage of sleep, you fall back into a deep stage of sleep relatively quickly. When you're in a light stage of sleep, it's not that you, you don't go from light to deep, right? And so you go from light to even lighter sometimes. And so it makes it a little bit more difficult to fall asleep. So that time zone makes a lot of sense why, why people are awakening there. Now, I have a very particular method of exactly what I want you to do. So first of all, don't look at the clock. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you. Everybody looks at the clock, okay? <laughs> <laughs> they instantly do the mental math and then they say, oh shit, it's 3.30 in the morning. I have to get up at six, sleep, sleep, sleep. And they try to sleep, right? So here's the deal, man. Sleep is a lot like love. The less you look for it, the more it shows up, okay? So it, it's just like if you're out there trying to find that perfect person in your life, there's no, there's no universe where that happens. But when you shut up, sit down and relax, guess what? Whoosh, they come right in. Sleep is exactly the same way. If you have this anticipation, I got to sleep, I got to sleep. There's no universe where that happens. And there's a couple of reasons why. The biggest one has to do with your heart rate. So one of the metrics that very few people know is you need a heart rate of 60 or below to enter into a state of unconsciousness. If you're pissed off, what do you think your heart rate looks like? <laughs> right? So, so anxiety is not your friend in the middle of the night, but I can't get people to stop looking at the damn clock. So here's what you got to do. Remember we were talking before about non-sleep, deep rest. This is where that science can come into play quite nicely. So people in the middle of the night, they look at the clock. Here's what I want them to say instead of, oh shit, I got to go to sleep, is they say, oh, wait a second. I was listening to that podcast where I had that sleep doctor guy on. And here's what he said, is if I just relax in the middle of the night in a quiescent state, an hour of this is worth about 20 minutes of sleep. So I'm still getting some level of rejuvenation. So that's step number one is chill out. You're not hurting yourself. You're still getting some level of rejuvenation. So relax. Number two, we got to get your heart rate back down. Four, seven, eight breathing perfect way to do it. So Dr. Andrew Weil came up with this technique that he used with the Navy SEALs. So if you're a Navy SEAL and you're a sniper, um, you need your heart rate to go down before you fire a bullet because if your heart rate is above 60, you can actually change the trajectory of the bullet, believe it or not. So he came up with this technique and it's exactly what it is. Breathe in for a count of four, hold it for a count of seven, breathe out for a count of eight. What it does is it dumps out all the excess carbon dioxide that kind of sits in the bottom of your lung and means your heart doesn't have to work as hard. So your heart rate slows down. And that's what we're looking for. So what I tell people in the middle of the night is, look, if you're gonna look at the clock, which I can't stop you from doing, chill out, 
Try this 478 breathing and allow your heart rate to get lower, allow your anxiety to come out, and then the natural sleep process should take over. One other point, don't go to the bathroom. Um, so many people do this. They wake up at 3.30 in the morning and they say, well, I'm up, I guess I should pee. Well, when you go from a lying position to a seated position to a standing position and you walk across the room, what do you think you do to your heart rate? Raise it, stimulation. Straight up. And yeah. if, you if you're dumb enough to turn the light on in the bathroom. <laughs> Check your phone. And <laughs> right, you're, you're a goner because you just gave yourself a huge dose of blue light. You might as well tell your brain to turn off melatonin faucet. For sure. <laughs> Interesting. I, I think that's a great answer. Uh, question from Helen. I have been a shift worker my entire life, working mostly mm. at night as a nurse in intensive care. Thank you, Helen, for the amazing work you do. Mm -hmm. Are there any health concerns for people who sleep through the day as the norm because they work at night, even if they're more healthy with uh, their habits? Yes, there are. There are a tremendous number of them. Mm -hmm. To be clear, um, shift work is not healthy, mm -hmm. period end of story. Um, the data is pretty significant. We see significantly higher levels of depression, higher levels of suicidality. Um, we see a higher risk taking behavior, all of those things. Um, it's very difficult to keep um, shift workers healthy for long periods of time. If I was a shift worker and I've worked with many shift workers, the biggest thing that we always are looking at is nutrition, movement, and sleep because they're doing things in the opposite way. Your body is not meant to be asleep when the sun is out. It's just not meant to do that. And if you're gonna force your body to do that, you better make sure everything else is working for you because otherwise you're really gonna have a hard time. And so we really concentrate on things like nutrition, movement, um, exercise. And remember, movement and exercise are two different things. Exercise is break the sweat. Movement is just keep my body going um, as well as sleep. Mm. I think you might have answered this already, but I'll ask it anyway. Question sure. from Mary in Canada. Been a crazy couple of years for the world. Yes, it certainly has. We agree. How can we switch our brain off so we can sleep peacefully? So this is the second, uh, this is the third question that I get asked most often is how do I turn off my brain? Thank you. Um, so it's tough, right? So there's nothing easy about being able to turn off your brain. There's a few different things that we've talked about already that I think make intuitive sense. So number one is um, gratitude. Right. And so focusing on something other than things that people have a tendency to focus on. Right. Uh, is, is a good idea. What I also like to do is after dinner, if you've got something that's just rattling around in your head and you're like, shit, I can't stop thinking about this thing. That's the time to do to create what I call a worry journal. So just take a piece of paper, draw a line down the center, put all the things that just keep rolling through your head on one side and then on the other side, put the start of one solution, right? So if it's like my kid is messing up at school, the the part one of the solution is call or email the teacher to set up a conference. That doesn't mean you solve the whole problem. It just means you've started the path to solve the problem. You go down the list. Now you don't wanna do this right before bed because then your mind's gonna just be full of this stuff. So you wanna do it like right after dinner, maybe two or three hours before lights out. Do a worry journal, you get all that junk out of your head then just before bed, we talked before about some different things that you can do, including gratitude journal. Yeah. You know, just being grateful for where you're at, trying to relax yourself and then also being solution oriented and having faith in, in life and who you are in the process seems, yeah, it seems important. This is great. Uh, question from Adrian Pauly, who was actually a teacher of mine in high school. So Adrian in Australia, <laughs> I hope you're doing well. Uh, he was a, you know, a great source of inspiration for me when I was in high school. Amazing. Too. So he actually got me excited about public speaking. So Adrian, I hope you're well. Question from him, how important is the right pillow and how can someone find the right <laughs> pillow for them? So this is a big deal. This is a big deal. So a pillow is a bed for your head, right? And so it's all about being able to have support, right? So the, the object of the game here is to have head and neck support. And so you want your nose to stay in line with your sternum, right? So if you're a back sleeper, you're going to want... So what you don't want if you're a back sleeper is a pillow that's got too much fluff to it, what we call loft, because it'll jack your neck forward. It's hard to breathe. You can snore more, that kind of thing. So you want your head back almost tilted back slightly. So you'd want to have a very thin pillow if you're a back sleeper. If you're a side sleeper, you're going to have to make up for the space between your ear and what would be the side of the bed. So you're actually going to need a thicker pillow because again, you want your nose to be in line with your sternum if at all possible. Because if your head is jacked one way or jacked the other, this tense sends a signal to my brain that it's in pain. It's hard to get into deep sleep when there's a pain signal 
coming on top of it. So there are people out there who have something called fibromyalgia, where they have a special kind of brainwave called alpha delta sleep. That's kind of what happens when you've got pain running through your neck is you're like basically creating that situation. If you ever talk to somebody with fibro, they have crappy sleep. Mm -hmm. So you, you wanna keep it all kind of lined up if you possibly can. Other things that I, I like to think about, the shape of the pillow can be important. Um, when, you, when a pillow comes together, then the two pieces of fabric unite, it's called a knife edge. Um, the problem is, is it doesn't really do, like this isn't a knife edge, right? And so when you have a knife edge, you don't have as much support at the base of your neck. So I like pillows that have a gusset. So when the two pieces of fabric come together and then there's a third piece of fabric that comes around, that gives you more support throughout the product itself. So I, I like that um, to be able to do that. Or um, some of them have a cutout now so you can actually have the thick part right up here so you really want to think through the idea of finding a pillow that's worthwhile um I, there are some of them i know a lot about pillows there's some of them that have a <laughs> zipper on the side and i like that as well because you can remove stuffing mm -hmm. and and personalize it to your exact height that you need so like i have personalized the pillows that i have in my house right now and they're perfect they're exactly what i'm looking for um Unfortunately, generally speaking for most people, they need to know pillows are probably gonna not be helpful to you after about 18 to 24 months. So you should be replacing them about every two years. Mm -hmm. If they're made of memory foam or like crushed uh, latex or shredded foam or something like that, those will last about four or five years. Is that because of allergy concerns or the material itself breaking down and changing the shape? The material itself breaks down mm -hmm. uh, and changes shape. Um, and if, you're in, if you've got allergies, that's a whole nother ball game. Then mm -hmm. you have to really get more hypoallergenic uh, stuffing and things like that. Mm -hmm. A uh, question from Beverly. Uh, I'm a 72-year-old female with CMT, uh, Charcot Mari Tooth. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. This is the story of my sleep issues. Just when I think I've found the answer, it changes again. Although I prefer natural methods, I've tried melatonin tablets of two milligrams, which didn't work and made me groggy the next day, even though they were taken at the appropriate time. Something that is surprising is that even though I don't get much sleep some nights, I'm able to push through and function the next day. What would you suggest for someone in my situation? And is there a book of yours that would cover this type of thing in more detail? So this is a complicated question. So CMT is a degenerative nerve disease. And so it's never going to get better. It's actually only going to get worse as this progresses. Um, I understand and can very much appreciate where she is from the standpoint of wanting something natural. But to be fair, I'm not convinced that there's anything natural that would be as effective as something that might be pharmaceutical. Mm. So in her situation, I would be looking at her somewhat similar to what the way we look at a restless legs patient. Although to be clear, she has neuropathy. Restless legs is something very different. I would of course check for deficiencies. Iron deficiencies would certainly make her situation worse. So having any iron supplementation could be potentially helpful. But if she's really having difficulty sleeping, which it sounds like she is, mm. um, I think that a mild sedative could be extremely helpful. Now, it's not particularly surprising that she can power through uh, the next day on very little sleep. She sounds like kind of a go-getter. Um, so that doesn't surprise me. Over the course of time, unfortunately, her situation doesn't get better. It just progressively gets worse. So being able to attack it early on may make a little bit more sense and prolong a, a place where she's more comfortable. Yeah, work on that quality of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said. A uh, question from Tasha in Redcliffe in Australia. I have, I'm really interested in this question. I have very wild and vivid dreams and wake uh -huh. up exhausted. Do vivid dreams lead to exhaustion in the morning? And if so, is there anything you suggest to wake up with more energy? Sure. So most people, and I don't know her situation, but most people who tell me that they have very vivid dreams, they're usually chemically induced. So it's either cannabis, too much melatonin, a supplement, um, alcohol, things of that nature. Very few people have had vivid dreams their whole lives. Now, not to say that there aren't some, because there are some. Um, we can actually tamp down the vivid nature of the dreams um, using medications. Antidepressant medications actually slow down REM sleep quite a bit. Um, cannabis is another one that slows down REM sleep quite a bit. So there's different uh, methodologies that people can use, but the question becomes, you know, if are you really so exhausted from your dreams? Because what I would argue is, is she might not be sleeping well, like she might have sleep deprivation. Um, also, I would be wondering about the content of the dreams. This is going to sound rather odd, 
But um, for people who have undiagnosed sleep apnea, there's a decent percentage of them who have these very vivid dreams about suffocation or being underwater, uh, swallowing a lot. So it's, it's kind of this manifestation of I can't breathe mm -hmm. um, is coming through. So I, I would probably want to understand a little bit more about the content of the and the vivid nature of the dreams. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would also, the other thing I would want to be curious about is had she had a head injury, mm -hmm. history of seizure, uh, things of that nature. Could it be a neuro neurologic issue that's going on, tumor, there's a whole host of things that mm. could be in there. Uh, another really interesting question from Jay. Like many older people who live alone, I tend to fall asleep listening to the radio or a podcast. Uh -huh. Nighttime can feel especially lonely, which is not something not realized by people who have family or others in their home. Correct. Darkness descends and you're all alone. Again, every night, I get tired of people saying we should rid our bedrooms of pretty much everything that provides a sense of company. Following those sleep hygiene instructions, a bedroom can start to feel like a sensory deprivation experiment. <laughs> Right. And the loneliest place in the world. What do you suggest? What was his first name again? Uh, Jay. Jay, you are 100% correct. So I am the only sleep doctor in the universe that says it's okay to fall asleep with the television on. I have no problems if you want to listen to podcasts. Um, I don't care. If that's what works for you and that makes you feel better, go for it, bro. Like at the end of the day, loneliness does much more detrimental to your sleep and to your mental health than having a television on. OK, so please, please, please have a podcast on. Talk on the telephone. I don't really care what you do. I will tell you there's a couple of things that you want to kind of shy away from. So, number one, if you're playing on your phone, you know, while you're trying to find, fall asleep, like if you're trying to get your high score on Candy Crush, you're really not <laughs> trying to go to bed. Right. So maybe reserve that for another time. So like while you're trying to fall asleep, I think electronics should probably be removed. And if you want to have the TV on and it's bothered, the light is bothersome, buy some blue light blocking glasses. Um, these are uh, glasses that you, and they're 20 bucks, you know, like this is not like a, a heavy spend and you can watch television in your bedroom. My wife falls asleep with the television on every single night and I'm the sleep doctor. Okay. So like, don't worry, bro. It's all good. <laughs> Last question. Uh, it's from Anne. Can long-term use of CPAP machines reduce a person's ability to fall asleep? CPAP, C-P-A-P, is that right? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. So, so this is a great question to end on. Um, so when we talk about, so first of all, let me explain what CPAP is. Mm -hmm. So CPAP is called Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. So this is a device that is worn by people who have obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. So apnea is when your throat collapses in the middle of the night and we need to basically push it open. So what happens is they're kind of like having a hair dryer in reverse blowing up your nose all night long, right? So it's hot, warm air comes through a tube to a mask that you wear. And when it hits the area that's collapsed, it just ever so slightly opens it up, shoots clean air to your lungs, okay? So the question was, can wearing a CPAP ever stop me from being able to sleep, right? So the answer is, I can't understand how it would um, unless it was the noise of the CPAP machine that was maybe bothersome to you. There are some people out there that that can happen. The good news is, is that if C CPAP isn't the only treatment for sleep apnea that's out there, depending upon the severity of your sleep apnea, there are oral appliances, which are dental devices that can be helpful. There are now surgical interventions that can be helpful. There's also a new device out there called Excite OSA, where you can have a tongue uh, device that actually helps shrink your tongue a little bit, which can be uh, important. So there's a whole host of things. So if CPAP is becoming bothersome or not allowing you to sleep, there's other alternatives out there. Um, and talking about CPAP also leads me to think about snoring a little bit. And so I've got a lot of people out there who are affected by snoring, believe it or not. So it's like something like 46% of the population snores, which is insane. Mm. So I brought you these funny things uh, that I wanted to show you because you also have very narrow nostrils. Don't <laughs> worry, folks. I've been, I, I look at people's nostrils all the time. <laughs> so let me show you this little thing here. This is, this is really cool. So for a lot of my patients, um, believe it or not, there's data to show that if you sleep next to a snoring bed partner, you lose almost an hour of sleep yourself. Wow. So that sucks, right? Huge. Nothing fun about that. So this is a product that I personally use. And yes, I work with this company. They're called Mute. Um, so like, you know, hit the mute button. Mm -hmm. So this is an internal nasal dilator. So yes, you have to stick something up your nose, but here's the deal. It works. So as you and I were talking before the show, I'm a bourbon drinker. Right. And so if I'm drinking bourbon, my wife turns to me and she says, you better put your nose thingy in because I don't want to listen to you all night. Right. Because it when robbed you robbed me of an hour of sleep. Yeah, exactly. Right. Because, you know, if you drink alcohol, a lot of times the tissue inflames and you snore. So what's cool about it is this is a trial pack. It comes with three different sizes. But yeah, you just 
pop it up and in, it takes about 30 to 45 seconds to stop feeling it. Like at first you're like, oh my God, this is the weirdest thing. But let's be honest, just about everybody in the universe has had shit shoved up their nose lately, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. From COVID tests and all this other craziness. So I think this is the least offensive thing that's going to happen um, to you. But let me tell you, it definitely reduces the snoring. They're at like Walgreens for like 15 bucks, something like that. So I, I brought that for you. And then they Amazing. also make one for athletics. Yeah. So I actually use it during my spin classes. I use it before my meditation and my breath work. Um, and I find it to be very helpful there as well. So I just want to let you guys know and let your audience know about these cool products. Love it. You are a champion. There are a bunch of ways to connect with Dr. Michael Bruce, and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram at The Sleep Doctor. Grab a copy of his awesome new book, Energize, on Amazon and wherever you buy books, and check out his website, thesleepdoctor.com. Again, all of that and more will be linked in the show notes. Thank you, my friend, for your honesty, for your expertise, and for everything. I really appreciate all your time today. I, I feel like I really threw it out there today. I'm excited. This is fun. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that interview. As you heard, our guests love to hear positive feedback no matter where they're at in their careers. So share a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway so our guests know they made a difference in your life today. If you own your own business and would like to learn how to grow it using your podcast, download a free copy of our Recurring Results Roadmap. You can find that linked in the show notes. And if you're new to the Win The Day Show, hit the subscribe button so you can get access to episodes like this one as soon as they are released. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Finally, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So if there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day, share it with them right now. That's all for this episode. Remember to get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.